Check, check, testing. I'll just wait another minute and see if anybody else shows up. Can you hear me and see my screen OK? Excellent, thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Any questions before I start up? Nope. Okay, excellent, excellent. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about coroutines and coroutines versus threads, things like that. Some issues you might have with multi-threading and things like that. Um, I wasn't planning on doing a whole lot more tonight than that. Uh, Ed, but I wanted to leave que uh, room for questions. So if anybody had questions for any content we've had, yep, going to talk about that. Um, the uh, uh, if anybody had any questions on you know things that might be on the test, that type of stuff, um, I wanted to leave some space for that. Um, so let's start off by talking about threads versus coroutines. And kind of the basic idea of where these things come from, just to kind of clarify a little bit. Um, now, when you have a computer, on that computer, there's going to be different processors. And each processor can handle multiple things at the same time. Uh, you know, some processors might have eight built in threads, some might have other, you know, amounts inside of them. So think about this as you have T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, something like that. And based on the number of actual threads that the processors can handle, that's the limit of what can actually execute truly concurrently on your machine. So what happens is in your machine, when you say thread with some stuff inside of it, starting a thread in Kotlin, or using other techniques to start up threads. Each of these is going to have to run on one of these guys. And what ends up happening with the, the way the computer handles things uh, in a preemptive system, so we're talking preemptive multitasking, then what the machine will do is it will do a, a technique called time slicing. 
And really what it ends up doing is it takes a look at all the stuff it's got to run and splits the time up among them. So it'll do a little bit on this one. It, let's say that I had 16 threads over here. In each one of these, the computer will decide, I'm going to give this guy a little bit of time to run and he'll load up everything that needs to be on the stack frame for keeping track of where we are in the program, load up all the data that's needed locally, and then execute a little bit of it. And executing a little bit of it could be any number of instructions, depending on what the processor is set up to do. And after it's done, it'll say, okay, I'm going to just kind of put you on hold, freeze all your data, freeze your stack frames, and then go to somebody else and give him time to go. So if we only had one thread that the computer could handle at once, then we would end up having to, to split the time between all of these guys, saving off data, bringing it back in, and so on. Uh, so the more threads that the processors can handle, the more processors you have in your machine, the better your performance is going to be for concurrent programs or have running multiple programs at the same time. You know, Maybe you have a couple browsers up and the browsers are loading data from the internet. As they're loading that data, if you have multiple threads on your machine, it can take advantage of that to pull the data down. And this is all pretty decent system here. Everything's handled automatically for you using preemptive multitasking. But things end up slowing down a good bit when it has to do all this swapping around of data. What coroutines do for you is coroutines take advantage of the threads behind the scenes to actually do some running, but it preps those threads to handle coroutine running. So what we end up doing is maybe we create a thread, instead of having the thread to really run code, this thread is set up to handle coroutines. Why am I putting that in quotes? So if you think of this, the body of the thread being, here's my thread, and I have some code inside there. You can kind of think of this as being a big while true loop. So he's going to be set up to run forever and then handle coroutine. So just go ahead and take the continuation for the coroutine, pass it to a coroutine, handle it. And the coroutine management system will keep track of which coroutines are there and throw coroutines, throw the actual coroutine code to that thread to actually execute it. So we're still using threads behind the scenes, but what we're doing is batching these threads into dispatchers. So you might have IO default main or even custom dispatchers, which keep track of a certain number of threads and a coroutine that says, I want to run on the IO dispatcher gets thrown over to one of the available threads to handle that IO. Then when the coroutine manager says, ooh, somebody's yielding or somebody's hitting a suspension point, he basically just kind of puts that on hold over here and says, well, we'll come back to it later. And he lets somebody else get tossed to that coroutine handler so that that thread can actually take advantage of it. Um, and this is actually super, super nice if you need to do pausing, especially. So if you have um, in a, inside of a thread, maybe you're doing a bunch of stuff and then you wanted to do a sleep for 10 seconds. In a traditional thread, that's actually gonna force that thread to sit there and wait and nobody else can use that thread at the same time. Versus in a coroutine, when you have your launch, you use delay, which is a suspending function. And what that does is it takes this guy, the coroutine manager freezes him, keeps track of how long it's been going, and then tries to send him back to a, a handler when that delay is up. And this is actually really nice because it, you don't have to use up that thread to do a wait. You can let that thread be used by somebody else. And this is kind of the, the big, big difference between threads and coroutines. Now keep in mind the coroutines are running on threads, but the management system for it is setting it up so you can actually have many, 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 many more tons of coroutines. Then you have threads and it runs super, super fast. So it's a very efficient system based on cooperative multitasking.
but it's pretty much automated by the way the suspend, and suspend functions are handled. So they really kind of found the best of both worlds between a cooperative multitasking system, which is where your code has to say, yeah, let somebody else do something. And you, know, you have to be a good citizen. And then preemptive, which is where the computer does all the work, they found a good mid-ground in there where it'll automatically do that yielding for you and let somebody else have uh, a chance to do things. So it's, it's really nice from that point of view. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to manage lots and lots and lots and lots of concurrent things. Uh, and you know, you're only going to ever have the number of threads worth of things running at the same time. But you can still have many, many more coroutines and they still run very quickly because they take advantage of the little breaks, the suspension points. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so the next thing on this, um, when you're starting coroutines, one thing that you wanna kind of keep in mind, well, let's talk about threads for a minute. There's really kind of two major types of threads. Demon threads and non-demon threads. And yes, we do pronounce that demon. Sometimes I hear people pronounce it daemon, but it's actually proper to pronounce that demon. The, the trick with this is that a demon thread will prevent the app from closing, uh, let's say exiting. Where it, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. <laughs> Let me put that in the right spot there. A non-demon thread prevents app from exiting while active. A demon thread is a special type of thread that basically is gonna be a helper. And his job is to only live as long as the application lives. So the application may throw him some work to do. Think about these uh, dispatchers that I've been talking about. The dispatchers are gonna set up a bunch of demon threads so that you can throw coroutines to them, but it's not gonna stop your application from exiting. So doesn't stop app from exiting. And that can cause you a little bit of heartburn when you end up writing some coroutines if you're not careful. Now, what we've done so far is run them inside of a user interface. And when you have a user interface running, you basically have a big loop called the UE thread, or a big loop that runs on the UE thread. And it pretty much says, go forever. So that thread itself is never gonna execute. And then in order to get out of your user interface, you pretty much have to kill the process or kill that thread or interrupt that thread. Um, but what that means is that as long as you have that user interface running, any coroutines are going to still keep running because they're still alive. The process isn't trying to exit. If you only have daemon threads left in your application, your application is free to exit. So we haven't seen any problems with that yet. But if we try running things inside just a main, and we're not starting up that user interface thread, and user interface thread is a non-daemon thread. So he can actually keep going. Um, if we just have a main running here, the main might launch some coroutines. And by default, if you launch your coroutines, those are gonna be launched onto some threads that are daemon threads. And so what this means is if you're running your main, you come here, you launch this, and you expect it to keep doing things, and then it immediately starts executing stuff afterwards in that main thread that was running. And what ends up happening is if you end up hitting the end of that main, it takes a look and says, oh, the dispatcher running this was a daemon, I can execute. And poof, off you go. So we're going to start there uh, trying a uh, trying out a couple little examples just to kind of see what's going on with that. But this is something you have to keep in mind in, in uh, any type of program you write. You know, if you launch daemon threads, then you're going to end up with the chance of whatever was launching them ending, and then the daemon threads just say, "Oh, I'm not holding on to the process. I'm just going to go ahead and kill uh, the whole application that's running here." Um, any questions on that concept?
Yeah, it's a lot better when I actually get them in the right order. So the demons don't stop apps from exiting. The non-demons do stop them. So let me switch back over to my other computer. I was doing this on my, my Surface book so that I can scribble. Um, aren't you glad that I didn't do this the whole term? Because if I scribble in like, like in person, if I'm on a whiteboard, good luck reading what I've written. Um, you know, unless I go really super slow. But you know, it's it's not too bad as I'm talking through it. But now if you go back and look, you're like, what the heck did he write there? So let me stop sharing that. Poof. And where's my IntelliJ? Oops, gotta set up Sizer. There we go. And now I can share the screen here. And I'm just going to set the Surface Book aside over here. There we go. And let's take a look at some examples here, just kind of starting with this concept of a daemon thread. And one second. There we go. Let's head my pen away before I lost that. Um, so let's start off by running up a main here. And to run a coroutine, I'm going to actually, actually start up a uh, uh, set up a context and a scope. So let's say context equals oops um, coroutine name. That's what I wanted there. And I'm just going to say worker. And let's put that on the uh, default dispatcher. So this is basically the dispatcher that's used for generalized background work. And before I move any farther, I'm just going to pop up a couple windows there. There we go. I just want to make sure I still I can see anybody raising hands or anything. Um, now let's set up the scope. So we'll say coroutine scope for that context. And then we can use that to kick off a coroutine. So let's do something like launch, scope.launch. And then inside there, let's do a repeat 10,000 times. We'll do a println of the number. And let's just see what ends up happening when we run this. So I'm going to run him. And notice that it just says process finished. We didn't even get anything printed out. Um, what if I actually put in here a thread dot sleep for, uh, let's say, 300 milliseconds? Let's see if we get anything now. So what this will do is launch this coroutine, execute the rest of this, and this is going to make it wait for a little bit. And maybe if we're lucky, this will actually give us a little bit of time to see something printed. Let's see what that does. Might actually print it all. We'll see. Well, we ended up printing it all. Let's reduce that a little bit. Let's make it 100. Whoops. Still got all the way there. Let's make it 50. Still got all the way there. OK, there. I went to 10 milliseconds, but I only got up to 8,043. See, see, in this case, whatever code that executes here may or may not give us enough time for that coroutine to actually run. So there's a couple things we can do to fix this. Um, one thing that we can do is use something called run blocking. And run blocking gives you a coroutine scope in which you can run coroutines and you can call suspend functions. But overall, this block will actually block the thread that called it. So as long as something inside here is running, we'll keep blocking for it. So if you wanted to call some suspend functions, we have suspend fun foo. And then inside here, we had a delay for a thousand milliseconds, something like that. We could actually put that call inside here like that. Now we can't just call foo outside here because we're not inside a coroutine and we don't have a coroutine scope. But the run blocking essentially creates a coroutine scope as though there's a coroutine running and then just blocks that main thread while we're waiting for it. So that's one thing you can do to execute something. Now, it won't help us here too much, because if I take this guy and put him up inside there, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, look at this. We're going to say block, launch this guy, and then immediately execute after that. 
And so we're gonna have the exact same issue that we had before. We're not gonna wait for that, uh, that, that coroutine to actually end. So one thing that we can change here is instead of using a launch, we can use something called async. So I can come here and change this to say async. And what async does is he returns something called a deferred. And if we take a look at the signature here, we'll see that it says returns deferred for some type. And that's gonna be some object that we can wait for the result. So maybe we repeat all this and then return some number. So this number is going to be the deferred result from this. And I can say run deferred equals that. And then I can say at some point, you maybe have some other code running concurrently as the coroutine. And then maybe I say inside here, deferred dot await. And that will wait for this guy to finish executing and return that value. So if I said val value here, we'll see that value is gonna be an integer. That's that 42 that's coming back from the coroutine. And so what this does, it lets us, if we wanted to have multiple coroutines launched at the same time, and then at some point we can wait for a result. So maybe we have something like that guy, I'll say refer, deferred one and deferred two, and maybe they're both doing some kind of computations. So this first one is gonna do some computation return 42, second one's gonna do some computation return 10. I can end up doing something kind of like this, value one equals that, value two equals that, and then println value one plus value two. Now let's actually change, I guess that's okay for now. So we'll print out value one and value two when we run this. And let's go ahead and run. And boom, we get that 52 at the end there because we we're actually waiting. So this forces us to wait. Now you can only run async inside of a coroutine scope. If I tried to take away that run blocking, um, oops, yeah, we'll just get rid of him there. And why is he why is he seeming like he's okay? Oh, the await. Yeah. The problem is that the await is a suspension function. So you can't do anything with it. You can't actually get the value. You can't wait for that coroutine to run. I was thinking the async with the, the issue, but it's actually the await. Um, so that has to be run inside of a coroutine or a run blocking, which gives you that context that he can run inside of. And then what that ends up doing for you is kicks off these synchronous things. The awaits say, wait until the coroutines have finished doing their job. That will end up blocking the run blocking. So we won't end up executing our main. And we'll make sure that we go through the entire cycle of those coroutines if that's what you need to do. Now, if the coroutines are just being used for responding to user interface events, or if it's some processing that you don't care if it's done or handled, um, and, the, and you don't want, you don't necessarily care for it to execute, uh, for uh, it to block the exit uh, of the function, then yeah, don't worry about it. Um, but if you really want those coroutines to do their job and then pull the results together and do something with them, you're gonna have to do something kind of like this. Okay, any questions on that so far? Okay. So um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about, um, wait a second, what was I thinking about? Trying to find, uh, I thought I had an example here that I was gonna show you that was something a little different. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So another way that we can make sure that the coroutines run before we execute is to tweak the, uh, the context. So instead of using a context that uses all the normal dispatchers, we can create our own dispatcher. And we can create that dispatcher based on one that handles threads that are non-demon threads, which means that it will force those to actually keep running until we're done. So let's take a quick look at something like that. Let's say 
Let's grab him. And we'll go to this guy here. So what I'm going to do inside here is instead of using dispatchers.default, I'm going to create a thread pool myself of threads that are non-daemon threads. And then I'm going to use that as a dispatcher. So I can do that by saying val executor equals executors dot new fixed thread pool and give it some number of threads. So this is going to be something that can execute things on these threads. And what an executor does is it creates these threads. And remember in that diagram that I drew, it basically has a little loop that says, I'm gonna handle the next thing, handle the next thing and so on. So that you can say, hey, executor, please execute this for me. And if there's a thread available, it'll throw it to that thread, execute it, and then the thread will go back waiting for the next input. I can use, I can create a dispatcher from it by saying, executor dot as coroutine dispatcher. And so this basically wraps that thread pool in the gunk needed to treat it as a dispatcher for coroutines. And it's very thin gunk. It's basically just using a thread pool behind the scenes that it can throw a coroutine to to execute. So now what I can do is instead of saying plus dispatcher default, I can just say plus that dispatcher that I created there. And so now these are gonna be running as non-daemon threads by default. Then you can actually configure these things to use daemon threads. We're just going to take advantage of the, the default behavior of new fix thread pool to set these threads up as non-daemon threads. So if I do something like this now, and let me get rid of the, the run blocking. Actually, um, yeah, that's, I want to get rid of that. And instead of using the awaits, I'm gonna go back to launches, but keep in mind the launches mean that I'm not going to get a result out at the end like this. I can't wait for them to be done to get a result. So I'm gonna say scope.launch, just gonna execute some stuff and get rid of that guy and make this guy be a scope.launch as well. And actually I'm only gonna do one. We only need one right now. Uh, and Get rid of him. Note that I don't have anything after that scope.launch. In this particular example now though, because I'm using a non-daemon thread to run the coroutines, I should see the entire thing run here. So let's take a look at what happens. There we go, we see we got all the way to the end. But notice something a little interesting here. I'm not getting a message saying that the program stopped. And if I look up here, I see that I have the option to stop it, it's still running. And the reason it's still running is because I've created non-daemon threads. And so those non-daemon threads in the executor are just sitting there waiting for some new piece of work to be handed to them. And they, the program won't stop unless they stop. So if you do this type of approach, you have to explicitly shut down all the threads that are being used there. So in this particular example, I just wanna say, do this, and then once I'm done, go ahead and shut things down. So I can say executor dot shut down now, and that will stop all of those threads. Once the threads are stopped, then the program can actually go ahead and, and finish. So what's going to happen here is we're going to do scope dot launch. The main will be done, but the th process will not be stopped because there are non daemon threads active. Once we get past this, we're going to tell the executor to shut down. Now, obviously, this example is kind of useless because we could do the exact same thing in a main without any type of coroutines. But if you had to kick off some work that you wanted to do while some other stuff was happening concurrently, then this would be one way of doing it. So kick off a thread to do that work and then do this. So what are we obtaining from the as coroutine dispatcher to get us a non-daemon thread? Well, the as coroutine dispatcher doesn't do the threads. It's actually this new fixed thread pool up here. So when we create this executor, the executor manages four threads is what we're creating here. And those four threads by default are non-daemon threads. We haven't set them up as, as uh, daemon threads. So the executor has that. And really this guy here, is just gonna be a decorator around this. So, or actually I just called it, it's an adapter. Uh, and the adapter, the coroutine dispatcher has a different interface than executor does. So we're just kind of wrapping it up 
using a really thin little piece of code to make that executor look like a dispatcher. And then it can handle some stuff underneath the behind the scenes. Um, so this is just converting it so the coroutines can talk with this new fixed thread pool. That's all he's doing. Um, so if we run this, now that I've done that, no problem. Now that I've added the uh, executor shutdown, we'll come in here. I'm going to stop the existing one and rerun it. Boom. And notice it says process finished. So we actually were able to finish our, our coroutine at that point. Um, so that's just something that uh, I wanted to make sure you're aware of. Um, depending on what type of program you're running, um, most programs now that you run, whether it's a user interface, whether it's a, uh, a server that's uh, handling requests, uh, most of those just keep going. You kick them off and then they go until the user exits. Um, so you, there's not as many of these that we'll end up writing, but you're going to have command line stuff once in a while. You're going to have one shot things that you run. You're going to have helpers behind the scenes that you might run, um, and they might need to do something like this. Um, but most of the time, you really don't have to worry about it too much because it's up to the user stopping it or somebody shutting down a server or something like that to actually stop the process. Okay, so we got that guy. <clears throat> Let's take a look at some other stuff. Uh, let's come into here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's think about things like, um, come in here and say, I'm giving a main. Let's think about this little guy for a second here. Oops, he needs to be a var. This little guy is super, super troublesome. It's a fantastic thing, but when you look at it, it looks like an atomic operation. And what that means is an atomic operation is something that cannot be interrupted by the computer. It's just basically like a single instruction, essentially. And the, uh, the, the processor would not stop in the middle. And it'll make sure that all of the things that are done with it happen together. Um, think about what that does behind the scenes. We have to fetch X. So the, the, the uh, processor is going to have to fetch X in order to have it memory and operate on it. Then increment X. And you know some instruction sets have an increment operator that just says increment by one. Some, you have to actually load the one and then do an add. So it may be one instruction. It may be two or three instructions, depending on what needs to happen there. Um, and then we need to write X back out to memory. So if you're not familiar with what goes on in an assembly language, for example, um, let's say for a, a Java virtual machine, what you might have is an instruction that looks kind of like load some address. And so that's gonna take a, let's call it like load int. That's not the exact name of it. It's been a while since I've actually dug into the virtual machine codes. Um, I actually wrote an assembler for the Java virtual machine at one point back in the 90s, which was actually kind of amusing. I kind of enjoyed it. I was taking C++ code and generating the, uh, the byte code for it so it could actually run on a Java virtual machine that was enhanced with direct memory access. Because that's like the big difference between C++ and Java. C++ requires direct memory access to do some operations. Um, I was working for a compiler company at that point, and that was fun. Um, so, you know, I did a lot of this type of stuff behind the scenes, and um, it's kind of neat knowing what the computer is really doing behind the scenes. So if we did this operation, you'd have some instruction that looks like load int, you have some address, it's going to pull that integer into the, the, the memory space for the, the, G, the CPU. And then we might have an operator that looks like ink. And that's going to do the plus, the plus one. So it's going to take whatever's on the top of the stack for the Java virtual machine and increment it. Java virtual machine is stack based. So each time I say load int, it pushes a new item onto a stack that the CPU is keeping track of. Um, the increment will look at that, that top item of the stack, increment and replace it. That's what he ends up doing. And then we could say store int 42876, you know, whatever the address happened to be where that guy is. Uh, again, not exactly what's going on behind the scenes, but it gives you kind of an idea. So, uh, you know, uh, an increment might look something like this behind the scenes. 
You, know, you do load int from the address, increment it from the stack, store int, pops it off the stack, stores it in, in memory. So the problem here, what happens if two different threads are trying to do that increment at the same time? So if I had something like thread and then repeat 10,000 and I said X plus plus, and if I had another thread over here that does the same thing, think about what might happen here. When we're talking preemptive multitasking, it's possible for the computer to interrupt this operation anywhere during these. So it can interrupt it at the beginning, it can interrupt it after the load, it could interrupt it after the ink, it could interrupt it after the store. And that is super, super dangerous. And this is one thing that a lot of people don't realize about these, these uh, post-increment, post-decrement, pre-increment, pre-decrement operations, is that they're not atomic. So if you do them from multiple threads at the same time, you can end up some really weird answers. So maybe here you'd expect this, let's say X started at zero instead. Let's, let's do that. Um, you might expect this to have X be 10,000 at the end of the loop here. And because you're running two things, you might expect the total to be 20,000. But if they happen to get at this point at the same time, they both load it and then they happen to both do the increment. Now they both have the same value. They both store it. We've only incremented it once. I mean, you know, they both incremented in, in their own memory separately, but when they write it out, you only have the value incremented once. Um, let's write a little example that's going to demonstrate that. We're going to be a little bit explicit on the code here. I'm not going to use the X++. Um, if I'm a little bit more explicit on the code, I can actually kind of force this to show the problem. Um, so let's take a look at what this might look like. Let's come into here. And let's create a data class here. I'm going to call it counter. And we'll say var value is an int. And I'm going to start him at 0, something like that. And let's give him an increment operator so we can actually increment this guy. So I can say fun increment. Um, and actually, what I could do, operator, um, oh, what is the increment operator in Kotlin? Let me take a look here. Overload. I haven't actually tried this before. Increment. Operator overloading. Go away. I don't. I, what? Um, increments and decrements. So ink and deck are the ones that I can up, I can overload there. So let's take a look at that. Operator fun ink. And it has to be infix as well. Or no, not, not infix. What's it complaining about here? Um, receiver must be a super type of the return type. Counter one, that guy, that should do it. Um, so what this is gonna let us do is create a new one with that or create a new value with that increment. Um, and actually, I don't wanna create a new value. I wanna do it in place. So never mind. I mean, this would allow us to use the plus plus. I think that should still work. I'll return this. Let's see what happens. Give it a shot. So inside of here, I'm gonna say val next value equals value plus one. So we're just going to keep track of what the next value that we want. And then I'm going to say thread.sleep with some delay here. Um, let's say, do I want to do it this way or do I want to do it as, um, I had a coroutine example of this. Yeah, actually, I wanted to do this as a coroutine. I didn't want to do it this way with the thread.sleep. So we're going to do that next value there. I'm going to make this as a um, suspend function. Actually, I think I need to make that a suspend function. And then I'm going to say value equals next value. 
So I'm explicitly separating these guys up. Uh, so I'm going to do this, create this next value, value equals next value. And then I can actually just say return this should be fine there. OK, so now we've got that guy set up. You know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it this way. I don't want to mess with that because I think the semantics are just slightly off doing it that way. Um, because I, I I think I want to return and with with the plus plus you actually want to return the previous value because um, it's a post operator that's the difference there so what I really just want to do is increment this in place we'll just keep it like this and in my main what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up some coroutines to go at this a lot and uh, see if we can actually get it to break so let's start off kind of similar to what I did here, I'm going to grab him. Actually, I don't need all those. I just need these guys. And I'll put that in there. I'm going to make this be dispatchers.default. And I'm going to do this in a run blocking so that it doesn't exit until the coroutines are done. So I'm going to do inside here, val deferred one equals scope dot async. So we're gonna do some stuff inside there. Let's repeat for, oh, 100,000 times. And we will say counter, oh, I need a counter. We'll say counter one dot increment. Now let's do the same thing in another coroutine. And then at the end of this, let's do a deferred one dot await. So we'll make sure that he's done. We'll make sure the other guy's done. And then let's print the value. Just to see what it is. Now, if this worked right, we should see 200,000. But we're likely not going to see 200,000. Let's see what ends up happening here. Well, that one we ended up seeing 200,000. I think I might need to put the delay in there because I, what I'm thinking is happening here is that this guy is completely running before this guy even starts up. Let's put a little more time in there. See what ends up happening now. There, that's what we want to see. So yeah, what I was suspecting is probably what happened. Um, with the 100,000, when this got launched, this one was launching, and the launching didn't take as long as this one to finish running. So that's why we saw the 200,000. But when I went for a much bigger number here, we're going for a million times now, we're not seeing 2 million because apparently this guy got to do some work before this guy was finished. And we got lucky that it broke between those two. You know, the, the two threads are going at the same time. They both happen to hit this at the same time. Then they both hit this one and we lost some. So if we run this one again, we should see that. Let's run it a few more times. We're going to see different values most likely. Just kind of depends on when the two happen to overlap. Um, we could get lucky and it could get to 2 million, but chances are at some point, you're going to have some problems if you're not careful. So what we need to do is we need to look at this and define what we call a critical section. And a critical section is something that should run atomically and not let anything else modify your data while that piece is running. So let's take a look at this guy. Let's copy him. That was four, right? Let's go into five. And let's change him to five. And let's tweak this a little bit to set, a, set up a critical section here. And something just beeped over here. One second. Nope, we're good. Um, so what we're going to do here is try to mark out where we care about data. And there's some pretty interesting ways to do that. It's a couple different main ways. The first we're going to do is use a primitive called or a function called synchronized. And this is kind of similar to synchronized in Java, which is a keyword. It's actually a function in COP. 
And it's a little nicer than Java because it can actually return a value. That's one of the things that's great about the way that Kotlin works is you have all these blocks that can return values for you. So what I wanna do, I'm gonna rename this guy first of all, I'm gonna call him Atomic Counter One. And what I wanna do is make sure, make sure that both of these are run together. So I can do that simply by putting the word synchronized and passing some object in. That object acts as a lock for us. And so what ends up happening is only one thread can ever touch this at the same time. You can't block it. Uh, so in this case, synchronize is gonna get uh, acquire a lock on this. Nobody else can acquire that lock. Execute this stuff. And then at the end, release that lock. Somebody else tries to come in, when they try to acquire that lock, it's gonna block. It's just gonna sit there and wait until it actually has the chance to get a hold of that. Now, because of that waiting behavior, this isn't great for a coroutine, because coroutines, you wanna to try to set it up so that any type of, um, uh, of uh, uh, access should be non-blocking. But when you're doing the critical block, you really need to do some kind of block. You need to, need to lock it somehow. So what we're gonna do inside here, this is actually going to make sure that only one thread can touch that at a time. So if I run this, oops, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one I ran. Let's, that all looks good. Let's run him here. We end up seeing 2 million. And if I run him again, 2 million. Run him again, 2 million. No matter how many times I run it, it's gonna be 2 million. So what you need to do when you're multitasking is make sure that if there's critical sections of code that have to be run atomically, one approach is to use this synchronized. The lock can be any object you want. So you could, if you wanted to have something out here, private val lock equals, oh, some string. It can be any old object you want, and you can synchronize on that one. And the reason that that's useful is that you may wanna have different blocks of code have different locking constraints on it. So maybe incrementing, you're gonna have some kind of lock here. Let's just rename it to be increment lock or um, change lock, value change lock. How about that? Value change lock. And maybe there's something else that you want to have, I don't know, general processing lock. If you use strings for this, I don't necessarily recommend you use strings for locks, but if you do, make sure the values are different. If the values are the same, like if I said lock one for each of these, and you're running on the Java virtual machine, Java will actually optimize those to be the exact same object. It won't be two separate strings. And so what ends up happening is you basically have two pointers to the exact same object using as a lock. Um, strings can be, excuse me, strings can be a little interesting in Java. Um, the compiler tries to optimize stuff as much as it can. So as long as the strings are different, they will be different objects. Um, so maybe we have that, maybe we have, you know, fun, do something else. And then we do a synchronized on the general processing lock, some stuff. And then maybe up here, we also have a decrement and we'll just change it to be a minus. And the way I've written this right now, only one of increment or decrement can run at the same time. So there's no way for a different thread to get a hold of that lock for one of these. So if one thread comes to increment, one comes to decrement, whoever comes into the synchronized first is gonna have that lock. And then the other guy won't be able to acquire it until this guy executes that synchron or exits that synchronized block. But we're allowing something else to run at the same time as increment or decrement because we have a different lock object there. Um, this is kind of similar to in, in Java, if you use synchronized by itself, you put that on the, the function name, um, that uses the this object as your block. So it's basically saying all functions that are just listed as synchronized are sharing the same lock. So only one function can ever be run at the same time. 
but you can also use this same syntax here inside Java to explicitly pick a lock. Um, well, that sounds weird to say. We're picking locks here, we're safe crackers and things, um, or locksmith. Uh, so does that make some sense? Any questions on that? <clears throat> That's something to be careful about. Um, and this is a good idea. Any Anytime you have a, uh, um, a, a an X++ or something that you need to protect, put it in a critical section because the X++ by itself is not atomic. Now they do, a lot of, a lot of systems have a, a class they call atomic value. Like in Android, they have an atomic value. And that handles this for you. It's very similar to this atomic counter that I just created. And it makes sure that the operations being performed are synchronous. Uh, so, you know, something you want to take a look at there, you know, either you make your own one that handles this, use atomic counter or atomic value or, you know, whatever the one is that it, it has on your system, um, or explicitly put synchronized blocks around when you're doing those plus pluses. Okay, let's show you another way to do the same kind of counter. Call it atomic counter two. So instead of using the synchronized thing there, we can use an explicit lock object. And the advantage on the lock objects is that there's actually some support behind them to help you debug what's going on, which is especially great if you get into the deadlock scenarios. Um, not gonna go into that right now because honestly, I haven't ever worked with that. Uh, but one of the things I've read about with uh, using the locks themselves is that they have the ability for you to help get in there and do a little more debugging, uh, which can be really valuable if you're, if you're having deadlock issues. So inside this guy, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a private val. Actually, while I'm thinking of it, these really should be inside here. Um, and strings are a really, really bad idea for this. Um, the way, when I had it outside, that was, make, that was saying that any instance of atomic counter, only one thing could actually access at the same time, which would be bad. Um, so for this one, uh, I might want to say, um, well, I'm just trying to think of what a, what a class I can use for that. I'll call it my lock. There we go. Now we're okay. Um, if I use those strings in here, again, Java is going to collapse those to the same instance. So even though I have different pointers inside every single instance of atomic counter, they were all pointing at the same string object. So strings, really bad idea for using for locks. It can end up causing confusion. But in this case, it's really obvious that we're creating these new lock objects to use. Um, now we can use the explicit lock support by saying val value lock for example, I'll we'll call it value change lock, why not? And we'll do a re-entrant lock. So we can actually come and use that over and over and over again. And what we'll do inside here is instead of saying synchronized on that, I can say value change lock with lock, kind of like that. So syntax and its structure seems very, very similar here. We're just using a different type of object. Um, and you can actually look at these objects to see if they're locked and things like that. So this will end up having the same effect. We're, we're creating these critical sections that can't be messed up, messed with. Um, then if we want to have that general processing lock, I can do the same type of thing. Here's another lock there, and they're two separate locks. And so I would say general processing lock with lock, like that, have some stuff inside of it. Um, so be careful. Um, now, ideally, if you're really taking to heart functional programming techniques, if your function has no side effects, so it's not updating data like this, if your functions just return a brand new value and the data coming in is immutable, you don't have to worry about this because you're never changing that data in, in, in place. Um, so the more you can write code like that and push the actual mut mutable stuff, push the side effects up the ch call chain more toward the top, you're going to have fewer places that you have to deal with these issues. So try your best when you're writing code. Um, and generally, I'd say in any language, um, but Kotlin in particular, try to keep it so you have pure functions as often as possible. Uh, most of the time, you're going to have a lot of functions that just process some data and return a result. 
Um, there's definitely going to need to be other functions that store the data somewhere, you know, put it in a database, get it from the user, go across the network, and so on. Uh, but the farther up the call chain you can keep those, the easier it's going to be to maintain and test your programs. And you'll have a lot less of these issues for multitasking to deal with. When you have pure functions, you can run those on any coroutine, any thread you want, without having to worry about conflicts between their data. That makes your life a lot of, lot simpler. So you can like send off partial processing, do you know ten partial processing at the same time, pull the results in, and as long as the data going in was immutable, data coming out is immutable. You take those values. You don't have to worry about any clashes. Then you combine them, and you can use them. So it can be really, really useful stuff. Okay, so let's see. The next thing I want to talk about. Let's go into here. Deadlocks. Now, if the easiest way to think of a deadlock is a cowboy standoff. So you basically have two shooters who are super honorable and refuse to shoot until the other does. And when you have a situation like that, nobody's ever going to shoot if that's their rules. And you can get really, really similar behavior in a computer program with, you know, waiting for a lock. Let's see, you know, let's, let's say it's more like kind of like grab lock one, waiting for lock two, someone else grabs lock two and waits for lock one. This is kind of a classic deadlock scenario. Um, and it, the way that I'm gonna write the code that you're gonna see in a minute here, you're probably never gonna write code that looks just like that, but the overall net effect can often result in things like this where you're grabbing locks and you nest them differently. And that can give you a deadlock scenario, which is really, really bad. Um, so you have to be really careful about it. Try to limit depths of locks. And if you do have nested locks, make sure you acquire them in the same order. Um, if you ever acquire them in different order, you're setting yourself up for a deadlock. And there's other ways to get deadlocks. Uh, but this is kind of the classic scenario for getting a deadlock. So let's create a class here I'm gonna call possible deadlock. And I'm going to create a couple locks inside of here. And let's see, I think, actually, I'm not going to use the lock objects. I'm going to use the synchronized for these guys. So I'm going to say private, um, let's do a class my lock again over here. And I'll say lock x equals my lock. Let's make that a val. And we'll make a lock y. Let's have a couple functions here. So we'll say fun a. We're going to try to do a synchronized on lock x. And then a synchronized on lock y. And then do something inside there. And I'm just going to simulate that by using a thread.sleep for 100 milliseconds here. Let's create a function B, which is going to reverse those two. And he's going to sleep for a different amount. So he has different types of processing inside there. Um, and if we call these enough, we should end up with a deadlock at some point. Because um, this guy is going to acquire lock X. This guy will acquire lock Y. This guy will try to acquire lock Y and have to wait until this guy's finished. And then he comes inside here. And this guy out here, before he comes through, might try to acquire lock Y, which this guy has got. And he can end up with you know, them waiting on each other. And that ends up being bad news. So let's take a look at a little main fear. Main. And let's do a couple coroutines here. Now, just note here, with coroutines, I normally wouldn't use a thread.sleep because that's going to block. Normally, I would use a delay, which doesn't block. If I put the delay in there, chances are I'm not going to see the deadlock on this. 
Um, think of this thread.sleep as representing some actual work, not just being a delay. So you know, we're trying to simulate work that's going to block this thread at this point. And because we're blocking this, we won't release that lock. So inside here, I'll start off my context. And we'll say coroutine name. Uh, let's call it compute, something like that. And we'll run this on dispatchers.default. And then let's do a val scope, coroutine scope for the context. And let's create an instance of this possible deadlock guy. And make sure I got the right one, good. And now let's actually try this. So I'm going to use a run blocking here so that I can kick off a couple of uh, asyncs that I want to wait for. And if this were to work, both of these asyncs should complete. So if I come in here and I say val deferred one equals scope dot async. We're doing a wait on him. We're going to do a deferred two, same kind of thing. Um, let's do a repeat. Let's try 100 times and see if this works. Maybe this will end up doing it. And I'll say call A up here. And then let's do a deferred two. We'll call B. And let's just see. Uh, actually, I want to say when these guys are done. So at the end of this, I'm going to say uh, Printlin coroutine one finished. I'll make this coroutine two finished. And we'll say all done if we get that far. Let's see what happens when we run this. Oh, I reran previous program. I got to hit the run it right in here. And now it's running and running and running and running and running. We'll let it run for a little bit just to give it some time here. Hmm. So the program seems to be hanging here, which is good for this example, but bad for a program in general. How do we debug this? Well, fortunately, a lot of in, a lot of development environments have a debugger that can help you see where these problems are. So let me stop this explicitly. And instead of running, running it, I'm going to run it in the debugger up here. When I run this, I'm going to let it run for a little while. I'm going to go to the debugger over here. And let me just let it run for a moment here and make sure it kind of settles in there. You see right now, I don't see any information in the debugger. I'm not at any type of breakpoint. One of the things I can do with a lot of debuggers is hit a pause, and it'll show you what threads are actually running. And if we take a look inside here, up at the top here has the thread, I see that I have these two worker threads here that are created. And note that it says monitor here. That means that it's actually hung, waiting to get access to what they call a monitor. When you use that synchronized primitive, he's actually going to the monitor part of these objects to acquire it. Uh, and instead of calling them locks behind the scenes, they call them monitors for the synchronized one. And whenever you see that, that means that he's waiting on something. So if we click on him, I'm trying to remember if it shows what it's waiting on. Where did that, there was an option for that here someplace. Uh, well, shoot. I thought there was something here where it's telling what it was waiting on and I'm not seeing it. And let's see. That's no, just the thread there. Well, I am blanking on where this was because I, I thought there was an option in here or would tell you who is waiting on what. And I'm not seeing it in here. 
I don't know if they've changed something or if I'm just forgetting where it is. I'm gonna have to end up looking that up. You know what, actually, I'm thinking of Eclipse because Eclipse actually had a really good way of representing this. Um, yeah, because you can see these guys are waiting. Is it gonna say inside here? Um, oh, I saw the word possible deadlock. I'm like, oh, it's telling me. And it's like, no, that's what I named it. Um, yeah, it's not telling us what it's waiting on. I'm going to have to look that up and uh, let you guys know in an announcement on uh, where that was. But I, I thought I had seen something in here that would tell us. That just shows where it's actually executing. So my apologies, I gotta, I gotta find out um, where that was, but I thought there was something that would tell you. But the thing here, when you see a couple things saying monitor, that means it's waiting on something. And those types of guys are uh, usually the, your, your chance of your deadlock. Um, and I swear there was something in here. I'm gonna see if I can find it. Um, but I, know, I remember in Eclipse, they had a really nice rep representation of it where, it would say something is waiting on some uh, on something that a different guy has got locked, and uh, it made it really obvious which threads were were uh, causing problems. Pardon me, I just cough there. Um, so what you then want to do is, if you see this for those threads, you want to take a look and see what locks you've ended up acquiring, and which order you acquire them in. So if you always acquire them in the same order, so I came in here, let me first of all stop this. Now when I run it, just let it go for a little bit. We'll see that it ends up finishing. Now coroutine two finished first because B had less of a weight. We'll see coroutine one finishing in a moment and then all done. So we'll see that that ends up being okay. Um, you have to be really careful. And th this can be very easy to fall into. Um, be careful if you're ever locking on more than one object. Um, try to keep those locks as tight as possible. And if possible, instead of uh, having the, the locks be done by callers, so instead of having these inside some caller to function B, try to actually handle these inside of the same object. So wherever you're using those same locks, you can take a look at the code and, and make sure it's consistent across all your methods inside there. And if these locks are private, nobody on the outside can end up grabbing that lock and causing issues. Now, if we use synchronize with this, that can be problematic because then somebody on the outside could also synchronize on that object. And you can get some deadlocks or some other types of issues there. So having custom locks or using a reentrant lock or something like that is preferable because then you have control inside there, assuming that they're private and you can, you're the only one who can actually contribute to, to making that thing uh, into a deadlock. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, and I think that's about all I wanted to cover today. I just wanted to leave time for any questions people might have about any topics we've covered, um, particularly in the second half of the class, because that's what's going to be covered on the, the final exam, which is next week. Yay. And then you guys are done. Looking forward to it. Um, some cool stuff here. This, this language is just a fantastic language. But are there any questions people had on any content we've covered? Or uh, let's see. Sorry if this is already covered. I joined five minutes late. Is this... Is all of today fair game for the final? Yes, yes. All of today is, is fair game for the final as well. So anything that's been covered after the midterm and up to the final itself, that's fair game for the, uh, the final exam. And uh, hopefully the stuff I've covered today is, uh, uh, makes some sense. And hopefully it'll actually help the coroutines make a little bit more sense too. So other questions. Same format as the midterm. Yep, exact same format. And uh, it, it'll be about the same difficulty, I'm going to say. 
think some people found it a little bit easier. Office hours next for follow up. Yes, I will have office hours on Monday or uh, Tuesday for this. Actually, is it Monday? Um, yeah, Tuesday of next week is the, the office hours for this class. So yeah, I will have a, the same thing there. Um, the curve will depend on how things go. And the only reason I like to do curves for exams are, it, it's hard to write a, a fair exam uh, to really measure it. And if it seems like everybody had trouble with certain things, then it's it's usually pretty obvious that either I didn't cover it well enough or the question is is kind of wonky. So that's that's where I like to kind of correct for that. Um, but you know, I it's you know going to totally depend on how things turn out, um, especially since you know I'm teaching this one live each term. So it's it just depends on you know how I ended up covering. Maybe I didn't cover a concept as well as I did in different term, or maybe I covered it better. Um, so, but if we do end up having like you know, let's say everybody the the top score is like uh, 85 or something, um, then I may throw 10 extra points in. Um, and I think in previous terms, it's usually been about 10 points that I've curved. Uh, and so it's not, you know, it's not, it's not really a curve. I, you know, I, I hate the bell curve idea. Um, it's just that, you know, if there's basically if there's questions that, you know, caused everybody the same difficulty, then, you know, I give a little credit just to help accommodate for that. Okay, other questions. And of course, if you think of anything, um, J unit. Oh, um, you know, I, I can, uh, I'll, I'll talk about J unit a little bit here. I will not include J unit on the exam, but I'll talk about it in a minute here. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, I did, I did talk about it a little bit. Um, I'm not planning on having that in the test, um, but I can, that's right. I did, I did have it in that video from last week. Um, when I was skimming over that video, I thought that video was actually pretty good. Um, one of my more effective lectures, hopefully. Um, but um, yeah, I can uh, go over a little bit of that if you're interested, um, but I, I won't do it inside the exam. So I remember seeing something about APIs on the syllabus or course description. Am I crazy? Um, let's see. And I can talk about APIs, I'm happy to. Um, but let's see what we had for this guy. So I'll first of all, look in the sample code section, because these are the topics that I generally wanted to cover. Um, so I don't see it on that list. But let me take a look in the syllabus. See what I had, because I thought I copied that from the syllabus. Everybody looking forward to Canvas instead of uh, um, Blackboard? <laughs> oh, me too. I've still, I've still got to set things up for it. Uh, so that's, that's happening this weekend. Um, well, let's take a look in here. Is there anything in here that I didn't hit that I wanted to hit? No, not seeing it in there. Oh no, I know you're crazy. I, I, that's that's been obvious for quite some time. Um, so, uh, but yeah, let's talk a little bit about it because um, uh, it's something that can be a really important thing when you're designing libraries. Um, but we'll just talk a little randomly about that. APIs stands for Application Programming Interface. And there's a couple things that are, are Kotlin specific that we can bring into here. Um, but the general idea is this is how one piece of code can interface with another piece of code. And generally what you're gonna do is do this when you're, when you're developing libraries. Um, some parts are hidden. Some parts are public. And the public stuff is what composes the API for your library. So when you're defining a library, <clears throat> a lot of times, let's see, how do I wanna do this? Let's create a module inside of here. I'm gonna say new module, and we're gonna make it a Kotlin VM Gradle module. 
and let's call this my lib, something like that. And this is a brand new module. Uh, that gives us support for the internal modifier inside Kotlin. So far we've seen public and private. There's another one called internal. And what internal does for you is restricts access to just the module in which it's been compiled. So let's see, is this, what just happened? Um, ba -bum 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 -bum. Let's see his build doc gradle. He's complaining about that now. So I think let's go up to the top level build doc gradle. So the top level build doc gradle gave a version. This nested module isn't supposed to. So I think if I just remove that version on there, we should be okay. Yeah, that's looking good. Okay, so let's take a look in there. Um, now, because that got screwed up, it didn't end up configuring this project correctly. And I'm sure there's a target I could run, but honestly, I don't know what it is. So I'm just going to recreate the structure underneath here. So I'm going to say new module, oh, not, yeah, not new module, <laughs> new directory source. And then inside there, main. And then inside there, Kotlin. See if that's going to work. And let's create a package inside there. Live one, we'll call it. And then inside there, I can create some different files and things. And what's really important when you're defining an API, most important thing, do everything you can to not change the API. The API is the part that people are going to code against. So if you change the API, that's going to break what they code. Now let's let's kind of pare that down a little bit into the types of things that are okay, the type of things that are not okay. So things that are okay. Adding types, not just to spell it out, classes, interfaces, enums, et cetera. So adding new whole types are okay. Um, adding new functions, most of the time okay. There are a couple times when, depending on if the function is an overload for something, it may be a problem. But in general, adding new function isn't a problem. Um, adding new properties, that can be fine as well. The thing to be careful of here, though, might impact um, extension functions that the user might have defined. Generally, you don't worry about that too much, but keep in mind, somebody may say, hey, I had an extension function with the same name, and now I can't see the actual uh, real function behind the scenes. Um, generally, adding things isn't as much a problem. Adding new packages, et cetera, those, those are usually OK. Bad things, deleting anything. If somebody called it, boom, they're toast. So you want to be careful about that. Um, whether it's a parameter, whether it's a uh, um, a function or a lib or a package or a class, deleting. Is a, is a really serious decision you have to make. And once in a while, you're gonna hit a point where you're gonna be like, you know, that way of doing things was a really bad idea. And usually you're gonna go through a deprecation process on that. You mark it deprecated for a couple of releases and then you delete it, um, <clears throat> if you end up deleting it at all. Um, renaming parameters. Let's say renaming or reordering parameters. This can mess up uh, the user's call. Um, with a language like Java, the renaming is fine, doesn't matter. With Kotlin, because you can use named parameters when you're making your call, it's really important that you don't rename parameters because that again will break people if they use the uh, explicit naming on their calls. Reordering kills them if they're not using named parameters 
if they're just strictly depending on the order of things. Um, changing types, I'll say here. Or changing types. So if you change the types of a parameter, that can mess people up as well. Um, let's see, what other types of things are, are evil here? Um, moving things between packages. Because again, they're going to have import statements that say, I want to pull in this specific class in this package. And uh, that can cause some, some particular pain points there. Um, it's really hard coming up with a good API because a lot of times you're not going to anticipate what somebody needs, but you have to be really, really careful about it. Um, another, another things that you might want to think about. Think about abstraction far more than the code behind the scenes. Would you use abstraction? Now, any code that you have behind the scenes of something, whether it's private stuff in a class, whether it's uh, non-exposed uh, classes inside of uh, a package, that code, if it doesn't use abstraction right up front, you can always add that. You can change it behind the scenes. It doesn't hurt anything. But when you're talking about the actual API, once you've written that, consider it as much as you can as written in stone. You know, and again, adding to it generally isn't a problem. But think about trying to, to lock that down. And so that means up front, you need to do a little bit more work on coming up with what abstractions you want to use. And lots of interfaces is one of the big abstractions. And the thing that's nice about that is, let's say that you make the interfaces be the only things that are actually public. And behind the scenes, you have, or, and you have some public functions that create instances of classes behind the scenes that meet those interfaces. That gives you a lot more flexibility to change those implementations behind the scenes. It gives you a flexibility to create adapters and decorators for things. So you can take advantage of some design patterns to be able to create a much more effective uh, uh, API, as well as behind the scenes, if you're using those interfaces up front, it still looks a certain way to somebody. But behind the scenes, you could change implementations, you could create bridges, you could create you know adapters and decorators, so that what the user thinks they're using isn't. Maybe you completely change things behind the scenes, but expose it using the old interfaces. Um, so that's something that you can uh, you can do that uh, if if you use a lot of interfaces and use some effective abstraction. Um, and I'll put down here, set up, uh, let's see, create instances, let's say concrete, using factories. So what you're exposing, the user will say create something, and that create returns, uh, the return type is an interface, but obviously behind the scenes, you create an actual class for it. Um, Abstractions are really, really important APIs um, because it gives you flexibility for the future. Um, if the API is only ever going to be version one, it doesn't really matter. But hey, how often does that happen? You're going to want to evolve this thing over time. So the better you do at your abstracting up front to make sure that you're not exposing details on the how things are done and just exposing the things that say what the user can do, uh, it's going to make things a lot easier up front. Um, actually, let's, one more thing I want to do here, adding enum values can be bad. Um, adding or uh, changing, reordering, oh, reordering enum values can be deadly. Because a lot of times with enumerations, people will store the ordinal value, so basically the order something appears. They'll use that to store it in a database or store it in a file or something. And if you reorder things or if you insert new values in, it can completely throw off what they're doing. Um, and if you insert new values, it'll blow away their when statements if they're, or their when expressions if their when expressions are exhaustive. So be really, really super careful about that. Um, enums can be super, super hard in, uh, in an interface or in an API. Um, 
And it's kind of similar for sealed classes and interfaces. Um, but the nice thing about a sealed class and interface is that you can create a subtype of it. So if you have a sealed interface, um, you can create subtypes. You're going to have similar issues, though, with people having exhaustive when statements. Um, you don't have the ordering issues, um, but you can blow people away on the, uh, the exhaustive stuff. So what you may want to do is create a new sealed interface that has the old sealed, sealed interface as a subtype. And that way, people who are using just the old sealed interface or the old sealed class uh, still have the same fixed values. But you can now add new values to that new interface that you've created. So you can actually extend it more. Um, with enumerations, you can't do that. Enumerations, you can never do subtypes of or supertypes of. Um, so that's one big advantage to sealed classes, sealed interfaces, that you can do subtyping, you can do supertyping. Um, those are kind of some of the main things off the top of my head that you want to consider. Uh, so let's take kind of a look at, we'll write, um, let's see, maybe we'll write a little, uh, a little list data structure as a library. So let me come over here. I'm going to say new file, my list. Oops, 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 wrong, wrong one. I want to do a new Kotlin file. There we go. And what I want to do is, first of all, define an interface here. So I'll say my list. And I'll go ahead and make this generic. And then we're going to have a fun add to the list. Let's say my mutable list. And item is going to be a T. And then a fun remove the item. And then maybe a, let's make this be iterable on T. Iterable is an interface that has one function in it, iterator. So something that's iterable can be iterated over. And you can use any iterable inside of a for loop. So what we're going to do here is have it return an iterator. Well, we don't, we don't need to. He has that iterator that's going to come there. So that's my in my list interface there. It's going to be nice and simple to start with. Um, let's say that we want to have some stuff behind the scenes that uh, we can work with. We can set up, that's the, let me rename it to be my mutable list. Let's create a class here that we will call, just trying to think of how I want to do this. I want to go too deep on this one. Let's go ahead and say mutable list. I'll just call it list node. We'll make this be a linked list. And he's going to have inside of him, uh, whoops, make a T there, val value, which is going to be t, and val next, which is going to be list node t, kind of like that. Um, I think that'll be decent there. So we're just creating a little data class. But let's think about the, the how this is being exposed. With what I've written right now, this is a public class, because everything in Kotlin is public by default. If I made it private, Nobody else in this package can use it. So we need something in between. If I call it internal, that sets it up so that anybody in the same module can use it, but I won't be able to see it outside of there, which will be nice. So let's create a actual list implementation. My mutable list. And I'll use the horrible impl extension on things there, which is going to be a my mutable list. Let's give him a T. Let's give him a T. Something kind of like that. We're going to implement our members. Note that we have that iterator that we inherited from the iterable. 
and we're going to need an iterator to be able to walk through this stuff. Um, and inside here, I'm going to have a private var. Um, since I'm making an immutable list, I'm going to make it a var here. Uh, head, which is going to be a list node of t equals null. So we have nothing in there to start with. And then the add is going to say head let. Then we will do a, let's see, how do I want to do this? I will say, I'll just, I'll just do a little more explicitly. If head is null, head is a list node of item. And else, you know, I'm going to go like, oh yeah, all the time. Uh, I'm going to go super, super uh, uh, trivial on this and just always insert at the head of the list. Um, so actually, I can do that like this then. Head equals list node item comma head. How's that for a simple insert? We'll just kind of throw that out the window. Now, you get reverse list out of it at the end of it, but I'm not really caring about how useful this thing is. We're just trying to do a little example here. Um, and then remove the item. We're going to have to try to find it. So I say var temp equals head while temp dot. Oh, let's see. Do you want to do it today? While well, temp is not equal to null and temp uh, value is not equal to item, say temp equals temp dot next. Oh, we actually don't need that guy there. We can do like that. There we go. So we'll just kind of walk along the list to find it. Um, I do need to keep track of the previous one. And then we can say prev equals temp there. And we can say if prev is null, then we're removing the head. So we say head equals head dot next. The amount of times that I've written a linked list in my life is, is nobody ever does this. It's only for instruction. Um, and otherwise we will say prev dot next equals temp dot next. Oh, shoot. I made that immutable, didn't I? Um, I'm going to be cheap on this and let's make the next be a variable. So not ideal, but it's all hidden behind the scenes and so not that big a deal. And we'll do something kind of like that. I think that'll work. Sounds reasonable enough to me. Um, so the last thing we have to do is implement this iterator, which is gonna be all sorts of fun. Um, so let's create a new, class here and we will call it my mutable list impl iterator. T is going to be an iterator T. And we're going to pass in a, let's see how I want to do this. We'll just pass in a node. So we'll say head is going to be a list node T. So then like that. And oops, it needs to be a something like that. Implement those members. And what is not happy there? The function exposes its internal parameter type. Ah, so what's happening here is that's actually nice. I'm glad they do that. Um, he's saying that in order to be able to create an instance of this, you have to be able to have an instance of a list node, which is internal. And because this class here is public, there's no way for somebody outside of this, this uh, module to use it. Now, if I come in here and say, this is internal, which is really what I intended, that goes away. Because the only things that are trying to, that can ever try to create it are internal, which means they have access to that list node. So very nice. Um, and let's actually do it this way. 
we'll say private var current equals head. And then let's see what we get here. So has next is going to be current is not equal to null. And next is going to do a um, current blip, blip, uh, value. And let's see, I don't want to do this. I'm going to have to do a current equals current dot next. It's going to have to be the last thing that happens here. So I'll just do an apply on this guy and put him inside of there. Boom, that should work. Um, and I'm being a little nice on this iterator here and just returning a null if uh, if, if the value is uh, not found. Um, really should throw an exception. So let's, let's actually do that. I won't be nice. I'll throw an exception. I'll just say uh, legal state exception is good enough. Kotlin one, there we go. Okay, and should be able to say equals like that. And I think that'll looks good. Okay, so because this is internal, nobody outside this module can see it. And I can use other internal things and uh, it should make my life a, a little bit better there. I think that's right. So now let's create some helper functions. And whoops, I didn't mean to create a class there. I'm gonna say a, you know, my mutable list. I'm not gonna bother with the of. Well, why not? Uh, so we'll say var arg items t, we need to put a t over here. And he's gonna return a my list, my mutable list, which is that interface. And let's create a my, whoops. My, my mutable list impl t dot apply. And we can add the items in there. So we'll say items for each, add it. Um, now again, it's gonna put them in reverse order. So if we wanted to, we could reverse it before we, we do the, the that, I'm not gonna bother. Um, but this gives us a helper function to create that. And notice that this function is returning the interface. So there's nothing on the outside that would let it know that I'm creating that my mutable list symbol. Um, all they know and all they can use is the fact that it's a my mutable list. So by doing this, it gives you a ton of flexibility in the future. You can set this up so that you can change the type of the list. You know, Maybe you want the list to be backed with an array. Maybe you want the list to be doubly linked. Maybe you want to do something else with it. Um, you can change that and it doesn't affect the caller. If instead I had this returning the my mutable list impl, now I've exposed that to the caller and he knows about that. I'm stuck with that and I can't change the API without breaking him. So you want to be careful on that. Um, so I think we've got a decent little library here. Let's see, do we have a, yeah, here's where I was doing this. Let's go ahead and put a little main in here. And what I want to do is use that module. Right now he's a completely separate module. So I have to be able to pull him in as a dependency. If we take a look in Gradle down here, we have the settings.gradle file, who says, I'm going to include MyLib as part of my compilation process. So MyLib is now available as part of my compilation. So I should be able to come into the source up here and say that I want to use it as a dependency. So down here where I have dependencies, I can come in and say project colon MyLib. Uh, I don't think I'm going to need the colon in the way this is set up because I've actually nested it underneath the main Normally I'd have a, a, base pro, a base module underneath this to start with that would be kind of my application. Um, I 
think this will work without the colon. But if you have if you have um, a, a base or an application module, and then a, a sibling, you would need to use a colon to say go to the sibling. I think this is right. I haven't really worked with a project that had nest like this structured like this with a nested module. So we'll see what happens. And let's go back to this guy and see if we can actually create one of these guys. So I'm going to say val list equals my mutable list of, isn't that what I called it? Yeah, so I don't think, I don't think that dependency worked right. Let me come back in here and take a look. I think I need that colon. Let's see what happens. And then we'll go back to seven. Huh. Okay, so why is that not working for me? Kotlin seems to be right there. That all looks good. Let me run a build first here. Okay, so why is that not working for me? Huh. Oh, oh. I just said project. I didn't say use it as an implementation. And let's try that now. Let's see if that'll work. And where did the one go that I was working on? Seven. There he is. OK, so my mutable list of. And let's just put some strings inside there. And then I should be able to use this in a for item in list. Something kind of like that. Now let's see if that works. And operation is not implemented. Oh, hey, I never, I didn't actually finish that one there. So I need to actually have it return that. So let's say equals my mutable list impl iterator t passing in head. So we're just going to create an iterator that starts there. And what is he not happy about? So the, with the way I've written this right now, because I used the equals and didn't have an explicit type, it makes the signature be my mutable list impl iterator, which is um, an internal function. And again, we're exposing it from a public function. So we don't want to do that. I need to explicitly put a type on here, iterator t, and then that should go away. There we go. I can actually get rid of that because that's redundant. There. Now let's try this guy. And there we go, CBA, exactly what we expected, and, and they're reversed. Um, so that gives me some uh, exposed items there. If I try from here to say val list node equals my list node, we'll notice that it's not accessible. It's internal. It can be shared across different uh, um, uh, classes and types inside that module but I can't see it. And so I'm only exposing interfaces here, which makes it much more flexible and I can change things over time. Make sense so far? And there's just one other thing I wanna talk about for, uh, for APIs. Um, you know, kind of creating them as a bit of an art, um, but one of the things that you should really super consider
is a concept called semantic versioning. Um, there's a lot of good articles out there on, on different styles of semantic versioning, but the idea is that the version number you pick for something helps somebody know how that API has changed over time. And it's pretty straightforward. A lot of times what people will use is a VV, RR, MM, BBBB type format. And what this format does is VV is the major version. If it changes, it's a breaking change. And what that means is it's your way of telling the user of this API, if they had a version one dot something they were using and suddenly have version two, it's your way of telling them, hey, I changed some things big time here and you're probably gonna break if you try just upgrading. Um, you wanna try to not do that as much as you can. <clears throat> but sometimes you'll have version one of an API and decide later, you know, there's a much better way to do this. Let me create the version two, not worry about backwards compatibility and make all those breaking changes. And then when you call it version two, the user knows that those breaking changes are coming. So that's something you can do to help uh, do that. Um, Gradle itself uses this pretty well. Whenever that top level number changes, there's probably going to be something in there that has gone away uh, and not available. And you're, there's a chance that you're going to have plugins that don't break. Um, they do some pretty good warnings before that happens to tell you, hey, this feature is deprecated. It's probably going to be removed in the next release, so you better change things. Um, but at the same time, it's a bit painful because you know, when you have this build system that's depending on a bunch of different plugins potentially, sometimes you're using a plugin that hasn't been updated in time and you can't go to the next version of Gradle, but then another plugin might need the next version of Gradle. So you could be in trouble there. Um, but the idea here is that if it changes, it's a breaking change at this level. The R is what they usually call a revision. And it's usually new functionality is, is what they're adding, you know, new ways to do things, uh, new functions, new uh, classes, things like that. But it should be, I'm gonna say generally non-breaking. Let me change the word generally there to say almost always. There might be some very, very minor things that end up breaking somebody on this, but most of the time, it's, gen it's, it's gonna be non-breaking. Um, and while I'm thinking of it before I move on here, something to be really, really careful about when you're writing code that uses a library. Let's say that I had uh, you know, this library here, and maybe, is there something I can put in here that's gonna be a conflict? Well, let's just create a class in here called, um, don't want to use list. Let's use, um, just trying to think of one that uh, will be conflicting here. Well, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, well, do I want to make a copy of that guy? Let's see if I can create a new module here. I'm going to get that same breakage that I had before. I'm going to call it lib2. So it's going to be some other library that I'm implementing or, or that, I, that I'm going to be using in my project. So he's probably having the same issue. Let's see, how did the settings gradle? Huh. That's interesting. It didn't include that. Call that lib2. And then up here, get rid of that version, which caused us a problem before. And let's add in a new, let me just actually copy that into here. And I'm gonna rename this guy. And inside of here, um, let's create a, Source being Kotlin. Oh, I need to uh, re import.
Um, I guess I'll move this guy. There we go. So now I think we're good there. Yeah. So now I can come in here and let's create a class called Funky. And we're not going to, I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm just going to leave it there called Funky. And let's say that I'm in, in this file here and I want to use Funky. Well, I need to actually pull him in first. Lib2 is what I called it, right? And we'll re-import all that. Come back to this guy. And we'll create a funky. Now, when I actually imported that, actually, let me undo that for a second. When I hit control space here, hello, or alt enter. There, when I hit control space on that, it gives me an option to automatically import that. So if I choose this, it's going to say the funky I'm importing is coming from Lib2. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, Kotlin and Java have what they call an import on demand capability, where you can put a star there. And what this does for you is that um, it says, if I see a symbol I don't recognize somewhere, see if it's inside Lib2. And if so, use it. Now let's say that I did the same thing up here. So in the first case, I'm saying if I see a symbol that I don't recognize, look in both these libraries and see if I see it. So, so far this is working just fine. Um, the big problem here, you as a user of an API, the APIs can add classes and generally adding a class shouldn't cause any problems unless it's a subtype of a sealed class or a sealed interface that you're using. So what happens if somebody comes along in my lab and happens to add something called funky, which is perfectly legit. I mean, somebody can you know, add stuff to their code, but as soon as they add that, check what happens out over here. Now, funky, it says multiple choices. If I float over it, it's gonna say unresolved reference funky. If I try to import it, it's gonna list both of those guys. My code has broken because somebody added a class. You as the user of somebody else's API should never use import on demand. And in order to help yourself not get trapped into that automatically by the environment, if we go to file uh, uh, settings and then underneath editor, uh, code style, Kotlin, you'll see under imports here, you have this option to use a single name import. Um, I believe when you first install this, it's going to say use import with star or use import with star with at least five names used or something like that. If it's either of these other options, it's going to be putting that star in there, which is going to get you in trouble if somebody in one of their projects happens to add the same name as something else. So import on demand is a really horrible feature, and I really wish they didn't pull it along to Kotlin. Uh, it was a bad idea in Java. It's a bad idea in Kotlin. Um, so instead of those two, if we always explicitly choose where these are coming from, then our code can't break because of that addition. So that's something to just be aware of. You know, if, if you use that, you're setting yourself up for potentially having a problem when somebody adds types. Um, and it's no fault of the API writers because they're just adding classes. It ends up being the fault of the consumer of the API. Uh, and that's a problem. Okay, so uh, adding new functionality. This is one of those cases where if they do a revision, it could break you uh, if you use that import on demand. So just be careful about that. And then usually they call it like the modification or the mod. And this is a um, usually an internal tweak, no API change. So you're not adding, you're not exposing any new functionality, but maybe you're doing a bug fix. Maybe you're changing the implementation behind the scenes to make it more efficient or something like that. So by using that, you're having a new version number for them. But as far as they can, they, they can see, it's not affecting how they call your API. 
Um, and finally, it's kind of an optional thing, but some people really like to use it, is a build number. So sometimes you set it up so that every time, you know, maybe you have a, a continuous integration system set up that does nightly builds for you. You know, you could use Jenkins or something like that. Uh, by doing that, uh, your, your code gets built every night and maybe you push those out as a nightly build that somebody can use and try out. Um, because maybe you have a group of users who want to try the latest and greatest and help find issues if there are issues. Um, so by having a build number on there, it gives it a different number for each build that's being created. Um, and it you know, generally builds up to whatever that next mod is. Um, so by doing this semantic versioning, when you create your, your project and put a version on it to create, you know, my jar dot, you know, two dot four dot six dot twenty three eighty. Um, by doing that, they now have a different version that they can use inside their build scripts when they do their implementation dependency. So like in this case here, you'll see that you have the version number in there. So they can put a different version number there and pull it in. So I strongly recommend if you ever write an API, do semantic versioning. I mean, it's going to make things a lot easier to communicate how things are changing. Any questions on that? And uh, and if you know if you are, take a look at some articles on semantic versioning because there, there's a couple different approaches. This is one very common approach, but there's a couple different approaches, especially if you're doing Android stuff. Um, because in Android, there's really two versions you have to deal with. There's one that's the actual version code, and then there's the public-facing version string. This really is the public-facing version string, um, but there are ways where you can map this into the version code number. Um, and Android also tends to have uh, some other uh, some other ideas for what you can do with these numbers. Um, there are some semantic versioning schemes that I've seen that depending on if something is an internal release or an external release, or for different platform targets, you'll skip different version numbers or skip different revision numbers. Um, so it, it's something, you know, do a little research on, you know, different schemes that may be used based on the tooling that you're using. And that'll give you a little bit more insight in how that works. Um, so, but, you know, bottom line on this, if you expose things as interfaces, this guy, when he looks at his type here, so it's just my, my mutable list, which is that interface. He doesn't care how it's implemented behind the scenes. Um, you can change that behind the scenes very, very easily. And if you want to, you know, you could, you know, one thing that I've done in the past is you, know, you have version one of your API, people are using it. And then you say, you know, I want to change things. You create the version two, but then have a set of adapters that make it look the same way that version one did. So the version one people can keep using it. The version two people can use the new API. And eventually the version one people can upgrade to the new API. So you kind of keep that, or you're bridging the functionality between different versions. Um, so that, those are kind of the main things I'd want to hit when I'm talking about APIs. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's something that you really, really want to put a lot of thought into what you expose. Because once you've exposed something, you want to do your best to never change that. Um, you know, expose new things, but try not to break it because otherwise users get really annoyed if you start breaking APIs. Any other questions on APIs or anything like that? Kind of a long-winded answer to the, the word API coming up there, but uh, hopefully that was useful. Okay, so any other questions on uh, other top other things that we've covered, or if there was something that you were hoping we'd cover that I didn't cover, uh, you know, I can either point you to things or talk for ten minutes on something. You know, anything that's helpful. Um, what areas might the two programming questions focus on? Um, I'm not going to say. I am going to uh, yeah, Kotlin. That's the answer there. They're going to focus on Kotlin. Um, it's not going to be something super tough. Um, there will be something with generics. Uh, it's not going to be as involved as the generics assignment, but I will do something coding with generics. Um, that's about the all I want to say on that. Other questions?
And of course, I set myself up for uh, a late night, you know, having you guys expect me to get the, the, the exam grading done as fast as I did at the midterm. Um, I think I had like too many caffeinated drinks and I was, I was up and I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this out because I don't like you guys to sweat over it. Exactly. Yeah. No good deed goes unpunished. Any other questions or anything? And if you do think of questions, you know, feel free to come to the office hours or put something in the uh, uh, the forums or anything like that. Yeah, my pleasure. I mean, if, if I can, you know, do the rapid grading, you know, it, it helps out. And uh, my grader for this class is is very quick too. Um, you know, grading assignments takes a little longer, um, but he he really just jumps on it and gets it out as much as as quickly as we can. Sometimes I have to wait a little bit to release the grades because maybe somebody's was late. Uh, but, um, you know, it, he's, he's done a fantastic job for me. Any other questions? Looking like a no. Well, thank you all for attending. And this is actually the last time I will be saying stuff to you guys in, in a class session. So thanks for coming to the class. I, I appreciate you guys uh, taking it. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. Uh, I hope that you try to use Kotlin where you can. Um, keep in mind that you know you can, if you have a project that's already got Java, because Kotlin can integrate with it really nicely. Just you know, you can create new classes, uh, and there, you know there'll be a few spots that you know are a little trickier to integrate with, uh, but you don't have to convert everything in a project to Kotlin. You can just convert pieces here and there. You can create new things in Kotlin, um, and if you can get some buy-in from uh, the project management. Uh, you can eventually, you know, convert the project over to Kotlin, um, and it's something that you'll you'll have to, uh, you know, try to get the buy-in of other people on the project. Um, but if you can demonstrate, you know, how effective Kotlin can be, and how simple compared to Java, and and by simple I mean, uh, you know, the the code isn't is verbose; it's just easier in general to write, and uh, especially things like null uh, handling. Um, it's that's just huge over Java. I mean, it really helps you you be uh, uh, have a much safer code. Um, but I'd, I'd recommend you know trying it on new projects and whether it's you know whether the project is a desktop app, whether it's a web app, whether it's an Android app, um, you know, wherever wherever you can use Java, you know, Kotlin's an option. And I, I really hope that uh, you get some good use out of it. Other than that, thank you all so much for coming. And uh, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I enjoy this and uh, I'm hoping I can uh, create a multi-platform class. Um, I just ended up accepting a, a job at Google. So I'm gonna be an Android developer relations engineer there uh, and doing all sorts of examples and stuff. And um, they, uh, well, thank you. They uh, um, have a review process for things. So it kind of depends on if they're gonna let me do that class. Um, and you know how long it would take to actually get the class set up after that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this new job. I start on the, the 16th of May. Uh, so uh, that'll be fun, but I plan to keep teaching. Um, it's just, you know, it might take a little longer for me to produce classes, I'll have to see. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna try as part of my job to get it more into multi-platform programming. So uh, I'm getting a Mac. I'm normally a Windows person, but I'm getting a Mac so that I can do Plat, you know, programming across. Yeah, exactly. It's like I'm I'm not a Mac person. I haven't used a Mac since the '80s. Uh, so, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, but it's like everybody on my team uses them. So, uh, yeah. I mean, it, Macs Macs are problems. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's um, it's something I'm gonna have to get used to. Uh, but uh, they also said that you know if I do need other machines, I can get other machines. So that's great too. Well, cool. Well, if nobody else has any questions, I'm going to say thank you for attending the course and good luck on the exam next week. And it'll be, uh, you know, 7.30 p.m. is when the exam will start. Have a great night and uh, good luck studying.